Good morning. It's great to see all of you. Our little ones are dismissed uh, for Children's Church, all those that uh, want to go there. I would like to begin this morning by asking for your prayers. I have the privilege this week, this Wednesday morning, of flying to South America to the great country of Peru and teaching uh, next week in a conference uh, with Latin American trainers from Mexico all the way to Chile and Argentina, all from across South America, Central America. And these are men and women who will be training others in preaching and teaching. And so please pray for my safety. And one particular request, please pray for my stomach. Uh, I've gone to Peru probably about 20 times in my life, and almost every time either the water or the food gets me. So uh, please pray that uh, God will be merciful to me this time and that I won't come back with some sort of stomach bug. I do want to give you a report very quickly before we begin about just exactly uh, what is happening with the videos that we shoot here. As you know, those are available through Vimeo, V-I-M-E-O dot com. And I've gotten a report recently, just want to share with you the incredible ministry God is doing through Lafayette Bible Chapel um, and through the messages that are recorded here. There are, across the world, 1,000 downloads a month of these sermons. Now, that's not hits. A hit is just somebody who's surfing and clicks on a site maybe for five seconds or five minutes. These are people who are paying to download and use these sermons in ministry. Pastors, uh, seminaries, uh, over 25 countries so far that have been uh, logged on and that have been tracked, mainland China. Middle Eastern countries that are close to the gospel. God is using this. And the actual statistics, and I've verified this from two different sources, not just Vimeo, but from actual people who have emailed me, there's around 10,000 people a month watching these across the world. So for a church like Lafayette Bible Chapel to have a ministry like this is only God's doing. And so please continue to pray for me as I study and prepare for these because it's going way, way beyond any place I've ever gone, any place I've ever done. And so what a, what a thrill to see what our great God is doing through this church. And so I hope that you're excited to hear that as well as me. So pray for me this coming week as I go to Peru, and uh, I will be back uh, after today in, uh, after three weeks. So, uh, but please come and support uh, the other great speakers that we're going to be having in the coming weeks before I return. Today we continue one of the most famous and favorite of all psalms, Psalm 19. And I want to use, to begin, before we do the reading of the entire psalm, a little chart to review our study last week and to look ahead to where we are today. Now, Psalm 19 tells us two major ways that God has revealed Himself to us. First, the first six verses of Psalm 19 tell us of God's revelation in the skies, the stars, the sun, but the next verses that we're going to look at talk about God's revelation in Scripture, in the Bible. The natural world, God's creation, is a big book in the heavens. God's supernatural word is a little book on earth in our hands. So two books. The creation reveals God's power and knowledge, but the word of God, the Bible, reveals God's covenant love and grace to us. We have to have both. No life would exist on earth without the sun. No plant, no animal, no human life without the sun in the sky. And there would be no spiritual life without the Bible. Very, very critical to our spiritual growth. And God's creation makes us see our rightful place. Many people think as we look out into the stars in this vast universe that that makes man, it makes us insignificant. I think it simply teaches us our rightful place, that in spite of all this vastness, God loves us. He sent His Son to die for us. We're important to Him, and yet we're also a created thing. And so, if we're nothing in comparison to the universe, what are we in comparison to God? Who made that, and yet He loves us anyway. So, it teaches us our rightful place, but the Scriptures teach us about our need of God's salvation. And that, of course, is not just what we need now, but what we need for all eternity. So let's move then into Psalm 19, and I want to ask you to participate with me today. I'd like to ask you to stand and read aloud together with me this entire psalm from the Holman Christian Standard Bible, as you can see on the screen. Let's begin together. Psalm 19, for the choir director, a Davidic psalm together. 
The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky proclaims the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour out speech. Night after night, they communicate knowledge. There is no speech. There are no words. Their voice is not heard. But the message has gone out to all the world, and their words to the end of the world. In the heavens, he has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a groom coming from the bridal chamber. It rejoices like an athlete running a course. It rises from one end of the heavens and circles to the other end. Nothing is hidden from its heat. The instruction of the Lord is perfect, renewing one's life. The testimony of the Lord is trustworthy, making the inexperienced wise. The precepts of the Lord are right, making the heart glad. The command of the Lord is radiant, making the lies light up. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are reliable and altogether righteous. They are more desirable than gold, than an abundance of pure gold, and sweeter than honey, which comes from the honeycomb. In addition, your servant is warned by them. There is great reward in keeping them. Who perceives, who perceives his unintentional sins? Cleanse me from hidden faults. Moreover, keep your servant from willful sins. Do not let them rule over me. Then I will be innocent and cleansed from blatant rebellion. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Let's commit this message to the Lord in prayer. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you for Lafayette Bible Chapel, for the great God that you are, and how you in your supreme power can use a little church like this, Lord, to have a world impact. Lord, only you could do that. And so I pray today that as we look into this marvelous psalm and finish it, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would be our teacher and that each person here would come away with something, some truth, some challenge, some encouragement to live life differently, to live life better, closer to you this week. And we ask this in the wonderful name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. Psalm 19 is divided into three stanzas, and each of the three stanzas has a different emphasis. And so I'd like to show you another little chart and and track the verses here. First six verses again, review of last week. The sky and the sun are God's silent instruction, as we read, not in human words, but in words that are nevertheless understood. These are words about God. And the name of God is used in verse 1, El, in Hebrew. Next, verses 7 to 11, God's written instruction, words from God by inspiration of His Spirit. And the key name of God here is the word Lord, which in Hebrew, Yahweh, the personal name of God. And finally, the last three verses, David's written verbal prayer, words to God, and as we sang in the wonderful hymns earlier, the two names for God, Rock and Redeemer. Now, El, which we find in verse 1, or the name of God, it is a shortened form of Elohim. You've heard that name before. It's the most generic of all names in Hebrew for God. God as creator, God as all-powerful. But then in the next verses, talking about the written word of God, we come to God's personal name that he revealed himself to Israel as their covenant-keeping, loving, committed God. And seven times in this psalm, Yahweh, our Lord, is used, showing the very personal nature of this psalm to David who wrote it. And finally, he ends with rock, which talks about uh, God as our refuge, God as our protector from an, an object in nature, and finally, what we're only told in Scripture, God as Redeemer. That means He is our Savior, He is our Deliverer, He is our Champion. So these four names, God, Lord, Rock, and Redeemer, unify this entire psalm and center it in God Himself. Let me ask you a question. Is your life centered in God the way this psalm centers in God? Can you call the Lord by those names? Is He your God? Is he your Lord? Is he your rock? Is he your redeemer? 
Many years ago, a missionary was traveling by horse and wagon to speak to a Native American tribe in New Mexico. He was late. His Native American guide drove the team of horses hard to get to the village in time for the meeting. On the way, a thunderstorm with those mile-high, dark, cumulus clouds began to blow toward them across the desert. The missionary told his guide, we're going to get soaked. Before the storm arrived, however, the guide turned off the main road, and he started taking the horses in the wagon toward a giant rock. The rock towered 40 or 50 feet in the air, and it covered almost an acre of ground. At the last minute, the missionary noticed that there was an entrance to a cave in this rock. The downpour began outside just as the uh, driver drove the wagon, the horses, and all of them into this cave, and there they were, safe and dry, as this thunderstorm occurred outside. And then the guide began to sing in the Laguna Indian language, Rock of Ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in me, in thee. Does that story describe your life? The Lord Jesus Christ, when he was here on earth, he said he wanted to be like a mother hen, that the little chicks could run under her wings for refuge and protection. Is that how you view the Lord Jesus Christ? Is that how you view our great God? If a rock could do this just for a team of wagons and a missionary and a guide, what could the God who built the universe do for us if we run to Him for refuge? He is the only one who can provide safety, security, shelter, but not just from the rain, not just from the troubles of life, but from the penalty for our sins, from death, from hell. Because Jesus, God's one and only Son, the one and only Savior, He was cleft for us. He was nailed to the cross for us. He was pierced through for us. He died for my sins and yours and then rose again. Have you found forgiveness? Have you found eternal refuge in Jesus, your rock and redeemer? You can by trusting in Him, believing He died for your sins and arose, and committing yourself to Him forever. Now, before we talk about verses 7 to 11, I want to take just a couple of minutes to point out the magnificent way that this is composed. Hebrew poetry is famous for its parallelism. If you look at English poetry, a lot of English poetry, the words rhyme. In Hebrew, it's the thoughts that rhyme are parallel to each other. Now, the most outstanding example in the whole Old Testament of this type of parallelism is right here in Psalm 19, verses 7 to 9. Now, I want you to notice there are six nouns, six names for God, for His Word, instruction, testimony, precepts, command, fear, ordinances. We'll talk about what they mean in just a minute, but right now we're looking at how this is put together. Then there are seven adjectives that describe what the Word of God is like. Perfect, trustworthy, right, radiant, pure, reliable, righteous. Finally, there's five verbs. Renewing life, making wise, making glad, making the eyes light up, enduring forever. So, do you see that there are six lines? There are three parts, the names, what it's like, what it does, in our lives, but it varies like a theme and variation in music. It's not just 666. That would be pretty bad, wouldn't it? Uh, It's 6, 7, and 5, the way this is put together. So then, let's go to the next slide. After this, there's more variation. You have two doublets, more desirable than gold, sweeter than honey, warned, and reward. So the whole thing builds and shows step by step how sublime, how wonderful God's Word is. And so the verses 10 and 11 crown the entire section talking about God's Word. Now, I want to use an outside-of-the-Bible example to help you appreciate what David did when he put this together. And I think sometimes that's helpful to go for just a minute outside the Bible and look at something that's completely different to help us understand something in the Bible. The sustained cadence of these verses, the rhetorical effect of these verses is similar to the repetition, 
the parallelism and the climactic crescendo in Lincoln's most famous speech, the Gettysburg Address. Let's look at just excerpts from this. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty, dedicated to the proposition that all are created equal. Three verbs, first paragraph. Next paragraph, we're only taking excerpts. Now, we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. Notice, nation repeated three times. Next paragraph. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate. We cannot consecrate. We cannot hallow this ground. The brave men living and dead who struggled here have consecrated it. And then the whole thing comes to a climax with that we are here we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that the government of the people, by the people, for the people shall not perish from the earth. Notice the repetition, the parallelism, even to the very last line. This is the same cadence, the same type of repetition and parallelism we see in Psalm 19. In Psalm 19, there is this 6 times 3 equals 18 structure, followed by 2 by two structure. It's not just a flat two-dimensional grid. It is a spiral staircase that takes us to heaven. It is the double helix of the Bible's DNA. And by the way, I borrowed that. That's not original to me. I stole it, as is what happens in most good preaching. Now, let's look at the words and what they mean in this amazing psalm. Verse 7 The instruction of the Lord, the word Hebrew word Torah, refers to God's teaching us, not just law, but teaching us through the law. And what is it like? It is perfect. This is a word used from animal sacrifices. The sacrifice was to be unblemished, without defect, flawless. That's what God's word is like. And it renews, it restores, it revives, it heals, it changes, it converts us. The tremendous power of the word. The next part of that verse, the testimony of the Lord refers to God as the judge, only here he comes off of the judge's bench, and God himself comes to the witness stand to testify to the truth. So it's a different picture of God. He gives, God is the one who gives the testimony to the truth like a witness in court. Then, and what is that testimony like? It is trustworthy, authentic, confirmed, sure, verifiable. And, but look at the effect of it. It makes the inexperienced wise. It teaches divine wisdom to baby Christians, to immature believers, but I have news for you. It teaches all of us because this, it, we can never get to a point of maturity in our lives as believers that we cannot learn something, that we cannot grow in some area of our lives. Verse 8, the precepts of the Lord. This speaks of statutes directions that are clear and precise. If something is important to God, it's going to be plain and clear in the Bible. We always know that. It's going to be easy for us to understand. And it is right. This is the term that means morally right. It is a geometric term, a term from geometry that talks about straight as opposed to crooked. Long before the 20th century, the word straight meant morally straight, upright, as opposed to crooked. It's not by accident that a dishonest person is called a crook. Even the language communicates that. And it makes, the precepts make the heart glad. It encourages, it brings delight and joy to all of us who obey it, and that is the key. It won't bring the joy and delight unless we obey it. Then the command of the Lord This is talking about, this is the same word as the Ten Commandments, as God's decrees. They are radiant, bright, clear, plain, sparkling, scoured, scrub clean. God's commandments are like a spiritual SOS on our lives to clean us and scrub us up. But they make the eyes light up. There's a story in the life of David about his friend Jonathan. Remember, Jonathan was feeling really weary because his father had made the foolish edict as king that nobody could eat anything until the battle was over. Jonathan disobeyed his father, the king's edict, and ate some honey. And what happened to him? His eyes brightened up. He got food energy from that, and he was able to do better in the battle as a result of it. 
God's Word gives us the spiritual energy that we need to obey Him, to live for Him. And so, just like honey gives us food energy, so God's Word not just makes our eyes bright up, it gives us the energy we need to obey God. Verse 9, the fear of the Lord. This is an unusual name for the Bible, but it means that the, there are so many examples in the Bible that should make us afraid in a good way, in a helpful way. Just like we need to be afraid of electricity, there's certain things we need to be afraid of, including sin. But many, many people are not afraid, as they should be. The Bible teaches us that fear. And it is pure. This is a word that means uncorrupted, undiluted, unmixed. Not just like flour in a recipe that has been, that is pure, but like a purebred dog, a pedigree horse. That is the type of purity unmixed that's being talked about here. And God's Word endures forever. It doesn't change with the times. God's Word is always in. There are theological fads that come and go, but God's Word is always in. It's always the same. And finally, the ordinance of the Lord. This speaks of God's judicial decisions that cannot be overturned. Even Supreme Court decisions can be overturned. God has the supremest court of all, if I may use that superlative, and His decisions don't get overturned. Not by any human court, not by any human being, because God is the ultimate authority in the universe. And there's two words that describe this. They are reliable and altogether righteous. True, never false, ever faithful. The Bible is an open book. The one book that you could never accuse of being hypocritical is the Scriptures, the Word of God. A story I love. J.B. Phillips did a paraphrase of the New Testament. It is the very best one. If you want to know the best paraphrase, it's called The New Testament in Modern English by J.B. Phillips. Every Christian should have that in your library, either the paper copy or an electronic copy, because it's a wonderful, it's only the New Testament, unfortunately, but it is only, uh, but it really does tell you idea for idea what uh, the New Testament is saying there. But Phillips had a problem. He was educated in liberal circles. And so he admitted that when he started work on this paraphrase, he did not believe in the inerrancy of Scripture. But as he worked day after day on God's Word, he got shock after shock about how true it was, and so he changed his mind, and before he finished this, he came to believe that God's Word is absolutely true. Phillips said that this was like an electrician rewiring a house without throwing the master switch first. The sheer power of God's Word electrocuted him into the truth. I mean, you can just, you can just get the image of what, the, but that's what the Word of God will do for us. So be careful when you study God's Word. It will do things to you. Now, how great God's Word is are in verses 10 and 11. First description, they're more desirable than gold, than an abundance of pure gold. Just as God's revelation in Scripture is greater than His revelation in nature, so God's Word is more valuable than the world's most valuable commodity, gold. But there's a similarity between gold and the Bible. You have to dig for both. You have to hunt for both. You have to mine and sift for both gold and God's Word. Bill McDonald in his commentary said, No prospector is ever more delighted with the discovery of gold than I am to find a nugget of spiritual treasure in the Bible. What a fantastic description of the tremendous discovery that happens when we study God's Word seriously. Does that describe how you feel when you read or study the Bible? Like a prospector with his little donkey and his, all of his equipment getting those little nuggets of truth. I hope that before this psalm series is over, four weeks from today, God willing, if He brings me back alive from Peru, we're going to start Psalm 119. And the big theme of Psalm 119 is loving the Word of God. And I hope that before we finish that series, if you don't like the Bible, I pray that you will learn to love it. And that those of you who love it will fall in love with it even more as we study that fantastic, the longest psalm, the longest chapter of the Bible. So pray for us. It's going to be a long time getting through that, but we'll do it. The last part of verse 10, it is sweeter than honey which comes from the honeycomb. God's Word is more delightful than the yummiest natural sweetener, honey. A lot of honey will make you ill, but a lot of God's Word will make you well. 
And by the way, do you know why God created honeybees? Well, first of all, it's to give us honey that's a picture of how much sweeter God's Word is. But also, God created honeybees to teach us about giving. The honeybee is probably the most or the best giver in the world. All she ever does is give. She gives to her queen. She gives to her sisters in the hives. She gives to the drones. She gives to the flowers by pollinating. She gives to us the most sweetest thing in the world, honey. That is ultimately not just a picture of how we should be as givers, but of the greatest giver of all, the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself. So we can learn from everything God created, not just from the stars, but from a small creature like the honeybee. And if a honeybee can do that by instinct, something that has been built into it without thought, what should we be able to do who have been given minds and hearts redeemed by God? We should be able to be very generous givers. So let's learn from the honeybee. Verse 11. Oh, one last thing before we go on. What is it that most people want? Most people want money and pleasure out of life. Two big goals. God's Word answers both of those needs. God's Word has eternal value. God's Word has pure delight. Money can put food on the table, but it can't put love around it. Money can build a house, but it cannot build a home. And God's Word can both build a home and put love in it. And only the Scriptures can do that. Verse 11, in addition, your servant is warned by them, that is his whole list of things of the Word, and there is great reward in keeping them. Verse 11 tells us God's Word does two wonderful things for us. First, it warns us about dangers, pitfalls, landmines in life. What a wonderful service that is. John Bunyan said this about the Bible, this book will keep you from sin, and sin will keep you from this book. For years as I have given away Bibles to new Christians, I have written that inside the cover. This book will keep you from sin, sin will keep you from this book. You know who I stole that one from? Billy Graham, because that's, I have seen more than one Bible that Graham himself inscribed and autographed with that, sin will keep you from this book and this book will keep you from sin. That's the reverse of it. The second thing, this book brings us great reward, not just someday in heaven, but it's present tense. Right now, there is reward by keeping, by obeying. Again, that is the key for those of us who dare <coughs> to obey it. Just a couple of observations before we finish this chapter, before we finish this psalm. I have a couple of questions. Is this how we usually think of the Bible? How do we normally divide up the Bible? What, we were taught in, what were we taught in Sunday school or in all the basic Bible books? Well, Old Testament, New Testament, divide the Old Testament, law, history, poetry, prophecy, New Testament, gospels, history, letters, and prophecy. This is a completely different way of dividing up the Bible. This is God's way of dividing it up because this is what it does for our lives. Paul tells us the very same thing in the New Testament in 2 Timothy 3.16. All Scripture is inspired by God, and what is it profitable for? For teaching, there's your instruction again, rebuking, correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man or woman of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. The goal of all Bible studies should be a changed life. If you come here week after week, and listen to me, and nothing is different in your life, then I am a miserable failure. Please don't make me a loser. <clears throat> Please, when God taps you on the shoulder and tells you to do something that you've heard here, not from Frank, but from God's Word, please do it, because that's the goal. If not, we're just wasting our time here, brothers and sisters. Now, let's look down this list in verses 7 to 11 one more time. Does this list of benefits and blessings look like what most people's concept of the Bible is? Sadly, many prof professing Christians, oh, they love the golf course. They love camping. They love to sit out under the stars and glory in God's creation. But put a Bible in front of them, boring, burdensome, bothersome. Other people think that the universe is awesome but they think God giving the law on Mount Sinai to Moses that he's a taskmaster. But look at this list. Everything is for our benefit. Everything is for our good to renew our life, make us wise, make our heart glad, make our eyes light up, 
and it endures forever, can do it all of our lives. This is why we have the Word of God. And again, I hope as we get into Psalm 119 that you may reevaluate your view not only of the Bible, but of the Christian life and what it is all about. A lady was on a ship sailing far from shore. She, or not far from shore. She asked the captain, do you know where all the shallow waters are? Do you know where all the dangerous rocks are? She is a little worried. No, the captain replied, but I know where the deep waters are. And that's the key. That's where the adventure begins. See, the Scriptures warn us not only where the shallows and the rocks are, but it also tells us where the deep waters, that great adventure with God, begins. Third and last stanza of Psalm 19 is David's response to God's dual revelation in the skies, in nature, and in Scripture. David stops talking about God, and now he starts talking to God. The wonderful psalm that we've looked at so far has taken us from up in the skies down to the pages of Scripture, and now into the hidden recesses of the human heart. David looks inside of himself, and what does he see? How far short he falls of God's holiness. Let's look at verse 12. Who perceives his, talking about David's or our unintentional sins? And of course, the implied answer is, only you do, Lord. Cleanse me, David prays, from my hidden faults. Notice that if a sin is hidden, if it is done in ignorance, it's still sin. You know that I have a wonderful home that God has given me on Congress, and so I take university many times to get to I-10. Well, there happens to be one of these police cameras right at one of the corners, very close to the intersection of university and Congress. And it will snap a picture of your license plate, and it will mail you a little coupon that you have to return with a check. Well, later on, on university, it's 40 miles an hour, but earlier it's 35. So one day I went zooming past this little camera um, at 40 miles an hour, and sure enough, I got the little slip in the mail that I had to return with my check to support the Lafayette Confederated Government, or whatever it's called. It doesn't matter that I was ignorant of having um, broken the law. I still broke it. I was still guilty. I still had to pay the penalty. And brothers and sisters, we either pay the penalty or someone else has to. In that case, I did. But of course, for our sins, the Lord Jesus Christ paid the penalty for us. In the tabernacle courtyard in ancient Israel, there was a bronze basin or a, called a laver, and it was made of bronze mirrors that the women donated, and it was filled with water. So the priest could first look in the mirror and see where the dirt was, and then he had the water to wash it off. The Bible does both things for us. It shows us in our lives where we're spiritually dirty, and then it provides the spiritual water, our truth, that as we accept that and pray, we repent, confess, and forsake our sins, we are then cleansed. Now, Sigmund Freud has been rightly criticized for many errors, but Freud articulated something that was quite profound when he talked about hidden abnormal psychological impulses in us that often rule our lives. He called it the id. Freud would never use the word sin, of course, but his writings in that particular case are more realistic than many Christians in terms of our concept of sin. Let me explain that. I think we've gotten into a rut over the years as evangelicals by defining sin as a dirty dozen sin list. Now, blatant sins are wrong. David's going to get to those in verse 13. But sin is much more than what we do. Sin is also our complexes, our drives, our hidden agendas, our phobias, and anything that is unseen or unknown that dishonors God. And I don't know about you, but I am filled with those. And the miracle of salvation is that God not only forgives us for all that, He also sanctifies us during our lives, slowly cleaning out all that garbage from our minds, from our hearts, from our spirit, little by little. How do you peel an onion? One layer at a time. Now, you can chop an onion, but to peel it, you have to peel one at a time. And that's really a beautiful picture of sanctification, that God peels off one layer, and man, just when you thought you had it made, there's another layer of sin. There's another layer of failure. Then God peels that off. And of course, simultaneously, He's also conforming us to the image of Christ. That's the good news. So God both convicts us over time and changes us and conforms us to the image of His Son. And this is why this verse, like the rest of the Bible, is so incredibly realistic and true to life. 
David understood so clearly that none of us rules our own soul completely. We're not in control of it. We think we are. And no one of us can extricate ourselves from this briar patch deep within us. But David was so sensitive when he wrote this psalm. He said, Lord, don't just forgive me for the things I've done. Forgive me, cleanse me from what I don't even know about. That is a heart that is supremely tender toward the Lord. It's the kind of heart that you and I need. And that's why the Bible is so important in our lives. The Bible is like a divine machete, next slide please, chopping through the poisonous jungles that entangle us. God's Word is like a holy flamethrower burning away the vicious vines that wrap around our hearts. Guys, a little bit of humor. As I found this picture on the internet, there was a caption that, ladies, you can check out for a moment. The caption under this picture of the flamethrower was, like a cigarette lighter, only better. It's a guy's thing, I know, I'm sorry. Um, But the Scriptures are God's unerring servant that cuts to the heart of all the lies, the misconceptions, the false beliefs of this world's philosophies and religions. It cuts through and burns away all of the man-made theories and ideas, and it even cuts through our mixed-up, twisted notions of right and wrong. Do you feel uncomfortable sometimes when I preach here, when you read or study certain passages of the Bible? Do you feel uncomfortable sometimes? Good. The Bible's doing its job. That's what it's designed to do. Verse 13, moreover, David says, keep your servant from willful sins. Do not let them rule over me. Then I will be innocent and cleansed from blatant rebellion. David knew a thing or two about willful sins and blatant rebellion. For a time, God, David did let them rule over him. But God forgave him. God restored him when he repented. So David prays, as we should pray, Lord, protect me from those type of awful sins. The verb keep here, first line, is used in the Old Testament of a horse's bridle and bit. If that's what it takes to keep me from sin, Lord, then bring on the bridle and the bit. And what did Jesus' half-brother tell us? In the New Testament, in his book, James, what is the area that we most need the bit and bridle in? The tongue, what we say. And of course, that prepares the way for how David ends this psalm with the words of my mouth. None of us is immune to these terrible sins. None of us can avoid them without God's help, the help of His Holy Spirit. And so God's answer to not committing these type of sins is to walk in the Spirit. We saw that in the Galatians series. I hope someday if we can study through Romans here together, we will learn even more about that walk in the Spirit that keeps us on the path away from blatant sins or blatant rebellion and willful sins. David then closes this psalm with one of the simplest and most beautiful prayers in the Bible, verse 14. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. The word meditation... Remember Psalm 1, verse 2? What does the righteous man do? He meditates on God's Word day and night. Not transcendental meditation, but Scripture meditation. And the word acceptable here, that is from the language, again, of Old Testament sacrifice. The offerings needed to be acceptable to God for, to be offered to Him. And, of course, what does that remind you of? We need to go straight to the New Testament, to Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, brothers, Paul writes, by the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing, acceptable to God. This is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, once again, acceptable, and perfect will of God. The battle is won or lost, brothers and sisters, in our Christian lives in the mind. And that's why as Scripture comes into our minds, it can and will transform us as we obey it and submit to it. David's prayer closes this astonishing psalm by tying the whole thing together. Let's look back again. First six verses, nature talks to us in unspoken words. Next, verses 7 to 11, God talks to us clearly in his spoken and written words in the Bible. And finally, verse 14, David ties it up. He asks that his words, both spoken and unspoken, honor God. You know, Psalm 19 is really a prayer. 
And I want you to notice the order of it, and we want to close with this. First 11 verses, let's go forward. First 11 verses, adoration and praise to God for His creation and His Word. Verse 12 is a confession of sins. Last two verses, a petition to be kept from sin and to honor God in both our words and thoughts. You remember in Daniel chapter 9, for those of you who were here for our study of that fantastic book, Daniel followed the same order. Adoration, then a long confession of his sins and Israel's sins, and finally petition. If you study the prayers of the Bible, you will discover how different Bible prayers are than our prayers. Bible prayers focus on praising God and confessing sins. What do our prayers focus on? Petition, asking God for stuff. But notice that there's only two petitions in David's prayer, to be kept from sin and to honor God by what he says and what he does. Pretty amazing. Let me challenge you as we close to work on your prayer life. Force yourself as you pray, before you ever ask God for anything, to just praise him for what he's given. And that shouldn't be hard because everything we have, God's given to us. So it's pretty easy to think of something God's done for us and praise him and thank him for it. Then how about confession, getting right with God? The things that we know about, the things that we don't know about. And then and only then, let's get to the shopping list. Because, you know, I guarantee you that if you begin by focusing your heart and your mind on the Lord, adoring Him, praising Him, worshiping Him, and then confessing and getting right with Him, you know, you're going to have your shopping list, your Santa Claus, give me this, give me that list, you know, put in the right order as it should be. David asked nothing for himself in verse uh, 13 and 14. He only asked something for God. Have you ever prayed a prayer in your life where you didn't ask for something for yourself? How about sometime today, maybe, saying a prayer where you don't ask God for anything? Just praise Him, adore Him, confess something to Him, and ask something that will honor Him. Let's close by bowing our heads and closing our eyes. Everyone... um, I'd like to just ask you as we think about this incredible psalm that I'm sure something here has spoken to you. It spoke to me all week as I prepared this. So I'd like to just ask you to take a moment of silence and talk to God. Maybe your prayer can be as simple as the last verse. May your words and thoughts please God. Maybe you need to confess some sin. Maybe you need to praise God for some blessing. Whatever, take just a minute to talk to God who spoke to us so powerfully through this psalm, and then I'll close this in prayer. Lord, with David we say, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. God bless you.
Christ the solid rock I stand All other ground is sinking sand All other ground is sinking sand His oath is covenant his blood Support me All around my soul gives way He then is all my hope and stay On Christ the solid rock I stand All other ground is sinking sand All other ground is sinking sand Shall come with trumpet sound. Oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All of the ground is sinking sand. All of the ground is sinking sand. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All of the ground is sinking sand. All of the Is sinking sand. Amen. Have a wonderful day.